Tech's talk. I'm going to start going from the speaker there. Uh, my name is Trey Lath. I'm the ED of uh, Executive Director of Maker Ed. Our next talk is CS for All, cutting through the challenges, oh, opportunities, challenges, and um, sorry, confusion um, by Gary Steger. So he will be up here in two seconds. So thank you. Give him a warm welcome. And thank you, Gary. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. I'm hoping the giraffe doesn't pay my talk a visit as it has at the last four maker fairs. Um, I'm Gary Steger. I've been working in education computing for the last 34 years, trying to help teachers make sense of these wondrous opportunities where kids can invent and learn by doing. I'm the co-author along with Sylvia Martinez in the back of um, Invent to Learn, Making Tinkering and Engineering in the Classroom. And I've been teaching programming and or robotics to kids professionally since 1982, but I've actually been doing it since I was a kid myself. So I'm going to talk about the, the newfound interest in computer science for all and put it in some sort of context that I think makes some sense. If you want to stay in touch, if you send an email of any sort to our robot friend at friend.inventtolearn.com, you'll be on our newsletter and you'll receive some information in the back. Um, I have to warn you, I'm going to speak quickly because I have about 80 slides in 20 minutes, but I'm optimistic we can get through some of the content. Around 1975, I was fortunate enough to attend a public middle school in Wayne, New Jersey, where the expectation was that every kid would learn how to program over a nine-week course. This wasn't school to work or vocational education or college workforce readiness or gifted and talented. It was in the rotation between making a souffle and making a tie rack. It was viewed to be intellectually rich and creatively expressive, and it was a good thing to do. Um, we were entrusted by adults to see what we could figure out, lock up you know, when, when we were done. And I had a similar experience to Bill Gates and Paul Allen, who you see in this photo, or Steve Wozniak around the same time. And for the first time in my life, I felt intellectually powerful. I felt smart, I felt competent. And I've been trying to create those experiences for kids ever since. So I have some, some ideas that I want to go through. Hopefully we'll get through 10. 10 big ideas of computer science for all. The first is that computer science is the new liberal art. Um, my colleague and friend Seymour Papert said about 50 years ago, the fundamental question is, does the computer program the child or the child program the computer? This is a question for democracy, for teachers, for parents, about who has agency over the machine. Because learning to program, above all, gives one agency over an increasingly complex and technologically sophisticated world. The second big idea is we've done this all before. Creative Computing Magazine in 1984 had 400,000 subscribers. My friend Dan Watt wrote a book on how to teach logo programming to children in the mid-1980s. It sold over 100,000 copies. In 1990, we gave laptops to the first kids in the world in schools in Australia, and we taught hundreds of thousands of kids to program across the curriculum. And yet, I think that we've spent an enormous amount of time and energy, uh, energy over the last 30 years justifying depriving kids of learning how to program. It's inexplicable to me, the anti-intellectualism that accompanies statements like, well, not everyone needs to learn how to program. Regardless of the field of endeavor you go into, having agency over the world is incredibly powerful. And there are some reasons for hope, although they're, they're curious at times, because we have, instead of every seventh grader in 1975 learning how to program over nine weeks, we now get hour of code. I keep waiting for hour of algebra or hour of five paragraph essay. Clearly, we don't take this all that seriously, especially in schools that are well-resourced. This is the real outrage when, when, it, when, when schools that have lots of resources pat themselves on the back for doing something for an hour. We need to recognize that computer science takes more than an hour. You, when do kids get to become good at something? When do they get to work on something longer than the course of an antibiotic? We also have some policies that are in conflict. In January, the president released the 413th National Educational Technology Plan and three weeks later announced CS for All. The problem is the technology plan three weeks earlier didn't mention the words programming, computer science, or coding. Um, and we're talking about, in the best case scenario, kids by 2025 in New York City being taught computer science. There's some good news. From, from some strange quarters. The AP is offering a course beginning next year called Computer Science Principles. That's computer science for non-computer science majors. So that 
it's a course that will hopefully appeal to a more diverse body of students. And I'm involved in the, the creation of a university level course called Beauty and Joy of Computing that's being rewritten for high school application. And it uses Snap, which is terrific because Snap is a dialect of Scratch. So imagine kids being able to use Scratch for years through physical computing, through animation, through storytelling, through video game design, and all the way up through formal abstract computer science. So there are lots of reasons to program. Um, I think the least compelling is that it gets a kid a job, although that's, that's serious. But I think, again, it's a way of controlling one's world. Now, I'm having some seeing funny things here. I think that fluency is the goal. You want to be able to write poetry with a computer. You want to be able to dance and sing and, and be able to test hypotheses and have the computer mediate a conversation with yourself. Then when you're unsuccessful, you have to engage in some debugging processes. When you're successful, you test a larger hypothesis, ask a deeper question, embellish, decorate. But for some reason, we think as adults that if kids jump through a variety of languages or environments, somehow they're doing something more serious or sophisticated. And I think it's a colossal mistake. Code.org is adding all sorts of confusion to the marketplace. I have teachers telling me regularly, I get to work in schools all over the world all year long, and I have teachers telling me, well, this week we did Flash, and next week we're doing JavaScript, and then C++, and then some Scratch, and then some Snap. And, and if you just go to the code.org website, every screen has a different puzzle. It's in different syntax, it's in a different language. Um, and if we want to get good at programming, sticking with one language and really being able to exploit it is, is really important. I think that modern knowledge construction is inseparable from computing. It's impossible to learn any other modern subject today without having experience programming computers. The fifth big idea is there's no computer science without computers. Only schools would invent things like computer science unplugged. This sort of kabuki theater where you do a jig instead of actually programming. Uh, um, now, that's not to say there aren't times where you should play turtle in the context of programming, where you can act out some concepts in the context of programming, but it's preposterous to deprive kids of computer experiences, and they hate it. Code.org conducted study, they asked students what their least favorite part of the curriculum was, and they over and over and over again said the off-computer programming activities. It's like, a, you know, this is computer appreciation, not computer science. Um, computer, computational thinking, regardless of what you think about it, without programming is just math class. And one of the things that Papert said decades ago is that writing a computer program is a way of explaining solving a problem. It's a way of having control. It's a way of communicating powerful ideas. We have multiple forms of programming. We can make things. We can contextualize mathematics. We can use programming to, in an instrumental way to solve other problems and we can control devices. This is a fairly new idea that I've had, that the standards are best premature. Last week I was speaking with someone from a large tech company who was really interested in getting kids involved in microcomputer, microcontroller electronics and, and physical computing. And he said, but you know, the real challenge is we have to find a way of assessing this so we can prove its worth to teachers. And I'll ask this question, how the hell can you assess something that you have no earthly idea what the kids are capable of doing? When you've seen a few hundred individual original projects created by kids with Arduino, then you can start creating benchmarks. Go into a good progressive school and ask the fourth grade teachers to show you a below grade level, on grade level, and exceptional piece of writing. They can do it because they've looked at lots of student writing. It's the height of arrogance to think that we should start with assessment for stuff we know nothing about. I would like, I would like to know what kids are capable of doing. Computer science is a con context for constructing knowledge, in mathematics in particular. Um, Papert had this idea of a math land, that imagine if inside the computer you would learn mathematics as naturally, as powerfully, as meaningfully, by messing about with powerful ideas, by living and speaking mathematics, as you would if you went to France and learned French in the context where French had power. And that the idea of programming was communicating abstract ideas to the computer in a concrete representational fashion. So here's an example of one of my favorite projects. Oops, let me go back again and see if this is going to work. Um, 
maybe. Ah, uh, sorry about that. This was a project, I'll explain it quickly, where I was, walk I was working in a fifth grade where the kids were being taught numerator and denominator for nine months. It was written on the whiteboard for so long you could no longer erase it. They were gonna have to throw the board out or chip it off. And what really infuriated me was if you ask the kids um, what a numerator and denominator was, they couldn't figure it out despite the fact that this was a coin flip and just a vocabulary activity. So I said the first kid who writes a program in Microworld, a version of Logo, not unlike Scratch, that lets me type a fraction in and draws me a graphical representation of that fraction as parts of a circle, I'll take you out to lunch. And two days later, three little girls hand me a program that indeed let me type any fraction in. They understood fractions for the first time ever. They were using numerator and denominator because those were the names of their variables. Oh, they were using variables and inputs and angle measure and circumference and diameter. And they were learning a ton of other stuff. So the idea that this is somehow um, inefficient is preposterous. You're spending a year teaching kids something they couldn't care less about and when, in what's only a, a vocabulary exercise. If you want them to engage in actual mathematics, programming provides a context for that. I was in a school in Los Angeles where the teacher was giving a lecture for 45 minutes on absolute value, sixth grade teacher. And at the end of the lecture, I asked her, what would you use that for? And she shrugged and said, I don't know, maybe seventh grade. Well, when you're trying to get your spaceship to land on your planet or your robot to ma navigate a maze, absolute value is a powerful idea. And so again, I think if our goal was no more ambitious than, than getting kids to to achieve better results at the existing math curriculum, we would teach every kid to program. Conrad Wolfram says that we spend 106 human lifetimes a day teaching hand calculation to children, pretending that computers don't exist. So there's var two different kinds of programming languages. I'm gonna go quickly through this, except to say the importance of this point is there are programming languages which kids can learn and kids can use, and then there's programming languages where you learn something else along the way. And the Logo family of languages come out of a Piagetian tradition. There's a lot of care given to how ideas are represented, to make the syntax either clear or invisible, um, or so that you're learning while doing programming. And I think I explained this to a school head that I work with as it's a choice between vocational education and the liberal arts. Of Sure, kids can learn JavaScript or C++, but only a few of them will. Most of them will never create anything from scratch and just modify other people's programs. It's, it's very different from being able to build something yourself and, and democratize the experience. So, you know, we could have the program on the left to flash an LED, or we could have the program on the right to flash an LED. And as things like Scratch for Arduino become finished, hopefully soon, um, we'll be able to do physical computing and a lot of other kinds of computing that the folks in the maker movement are excited about without having to learn a lot of tricky syntax that's there to trip you up. And, and, to, and that raises the bar of entry. The goal behind the design of Logo and Scratch and other languages in that family is to have a low threshold and high ceiling. And we now have an increasing number of block programming languages. Here are some of the ones that I really like. And yet, and by the way, if you go to inventtolearn.com slash stuff, all of this is on the, the website. If you send an email to friend at inventtolearn.com, you'll receive a link to that. Um, and yet, the machismo of us as adults often thinks that if kids are programming with blocks, that, that it's babyish or it's not real and it's not computer science, and that's preposterous. Here's an example, hopefully the video's gonna work, created by Alan Kay's research group and a new language they're creating called GP. And I don't know if you can see it. Did it do it? Let me try this again. It did it. So we have blocks. If you dissolve the blocks, you have words. Any questions? I mean, it's just, it's just programming. Programming is a way of seeing. It's a way of making sense of the world. We don't have to be staring at screens full of dystopian numbers. We can make beautiful images with turtle art. If I asked you to draw or paint that, you would think I was nuts. If I asked you to program it, you would think it was off limits. But in fact, with a couple of blocks and by playing turtle, you can create this beautiful thing and you learn about coordinates and randomness and a whole bunch of other concepts in a really concrete, playful fashion within the context of making beautiful images. If I asked you to write a program 
to, to draw that figure, you might think it was very difficult or, or impossible. But if you start looking at it, you recognize that it's small circles and then along an arc. So if you make a little circle and go a little bit and turn a little bit, you can make something like that. The eighth big idea I want to talk about is there's more to kids in computer science than video games. I often get nervous when we, when we pander to youth culture too much. First of all, what do you mean by video games? Most adults don't realize there's different genres. The people who program video games only program one genre. The kids who play video games tend to favor one genre. Not every kid loves video games. Um, and and this, this mistake is being made an awful, with great frequency, trying to inspire girls to fall in love with programming. Because, pro, you know, everyone loves video games. Well, not, not necessarily girls, and not every kid loves video games. There's a lot more to, to computer science and video games. Papert said if you can make things with computers, then you can make more interesting things. You learn a lot more by making them. So we could do Islamic tiling. And we could program that in turtle art, export the images and crop them, convert the PNG file to an SVG, send it to Tinkercad, turn the 2D into 3D by extruding it, send it to a 3D printer, make these lovely cookie cutters, play with them with Play-Doh, use ceramic clay, and then fire, hand paint the tiles, and you end up with these beautiful works of art. And what I love about this project is threefold. One, it only took me 15 seconds to describe it to you and you know how to do it yourself. Two, it moves from digital to analog. We're going from the screen to something you can hold, Three, it goes from mathematics to art. I know you had a math teacher in 11th grade who had a yellowing Escher poster in the corner of the room. And if you one day were wondering about it and asked why it's there, they might say there's math in there. They might not have been able to explain what it was. Um, here, you couldn't create this without having programmed the computer. Another idea related to this is instrumental computing. Using programming or computer science to solve other problems. So these two boys I met in Vermont a couple years ago, they built a marimba that they could play and they wrote music for and, and, and they, they had to figure out how long to cut the tubes for the marimba and they recognized that there was a complex calculation you needed based on the diameter of the tube and the frequency of the note you were trying to reproduce. And so they did something really clever. They wrote a scratch program that tells you how long to cut the tube. You tell what frequency you want and it spits out a response. The program here wasn't the final product, the marimba was, but they were using programming or computer science en route to solving another problem. <coughs> Ninth big idea, physical computing is a critical aspect of computer science. And yet, I have seen national curricula for computer science in Australia and England and the stuff that's being proposed in the US and they almost all suck. Not just by what they omit, but by, by their perspective and lack of, in, of imagination. First of all, as Sylvia likes to point out, if the first thing you see in the curriculum is counting in binary or first graders will identify an algorithm, you should, you should immediately close the book. This is just computer appreciation. This isn't computer science. A lot of the curricula don't allow you to touch a computer until you've memorized terms for months at a time. And, and in almost none of the curriculum have I seen any examples of doing simple things like, I have a knob, a potentiometer. It gives me a value. How do I find out what that value is? How do I find out what that range of values it, it are? Once I figure it out, like with the Hummingbird Robotics Kit and Scratch or Snap, I find out that the knob goes from zero to 100. Well, if I have a turtle on the screen, how can I write a program that if I turn the knob, the turtle will turn proportionally? Ask a third grade, sixth grade, twelfth grade student that question and watch their heads explode. It's not in any of the curricula that I've seen, and yet I think it's foundational, it's fundamental. Being able to know what kind of data you're getting and what to do with it is really important. And it's just essentially an arithmetic problem once you understand the actual problem. You know, when you have a when you have a longitudinal scope and sequence curriculum over 12 years, you have to do things like put if in second grade and then in third grade unless you take a more project approach to it. Now, one of the talks that was rejected here and at the ISTE conference next month was on the 45th anniversary of the maker movement. I posit that 45 years ago, my friend Cynthia Solomon and Seymour Papert wrote a, a paper called 20 Things to Do with the Computer. You can find it online. In 20 Things to Do with the Computer, they said in our image of school computing, the, an important role is played by numerous controller ports, which allow any student to plug any device into the computer. We're seeing a lot of that here. The modern, 
the modern maker movement begins with that paper. And yet, we can't behave as if the teachers are incompetent. If you believe that kids are competent, you have to believe that your teachers are, in, are competent as well. So in our workshops that we've been doing around the world, we've been asking teachers to use a very simple prompt like, inspired by the enchanted tiki room at Disneyland, you know, where the birds come from the sky and they per perform a, a show for you, make a bird and singing and dancing is, um, is, is appreciated. And in this context, we're having teachers the first time they've ever done anything with a tech, with a computer, making birds come alive with sensors and 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 and, and, and editing music, stuff that would have been a two-year PD workshop, they're doing in 90 minutes. Because one of the things the maker movement has taught us is there's no better way to learn computer science than to buy a kilo of feathers. <laughs> that when you can re-energize timeless craft traditions and use it in a cybernetic sense, there's a lot, there's a lot of bang for your buck. This this project, which I don't think you're going to be able to hear, it says when you approach the sensor, never send a monkey to do a bird's job. This was created by teachers in rural Arkansas, again with zero prior knowledge, zero previous experience with robotics or programming. One of the teachers in his group literally didn't know the difference between greater than or less than. Well, she kind of did. She says, is the crocodile's mouth this way or that way? Which means she didn't understand it. But in this context, when you want to have it come alive, when you approach, you have to deal with that sensor question that I talked about before. <coughs> Here's a Makey Makey project where the circulatory system and digestive system of the body are drawn on t-shirts with conductive thread and snaps. You point it somewhere on your body and then an animation or a web page or a tutorial you created in Scratch Plays. Or a, a harp made with conductive thread, a purloined hotel luggage trolley and a Makey Makey. At our Summer Institute Constructing Modern Knowledge last year, a group of teachers and principals made this dress that responds to noise or pulsates with music. Now this is a nice engineering project, it's a nice computer science project, but we'd be remiss to not point out that they made a freaking dress. And it's tailored. And we don't have to just suggest that this is a way of attracting girls into computer science. If you watch the kids sewing here, you'll see plenty of boys learning how to do it, because sewing machines are cool. And we don't have to be prejudiced in our view of what's going to attract which kind of students. If, we can, if we're concerned about girls in STEM, I found that there's nothing better than drones. <laughs> Using Tickle, which is a iPad version of Scratch, whose secret sauce is controlling spheros and mini drones and light blue beans and Philip Hughes lights and toys of all sorts. Kids can make their toys come alive. And these sub $60 drones now are, are now flying turtles. Where we're giving kids access to not only computer science and engineering, but to three dimensional space and the mathematics that's associated with it. And I was shocked, but I'm no longer surprised by when I bring these drones into a school, the girls will knock the boys over to get at them. Uh, there's something really empowering about making something fly. The last big idea that I wanna share with you is there's no subject for personal computing. I mentioned very quickly earlier that 26 years ago I began working in schools where every kid had a laptop. The idea that in 2016 we're still arguing over whether kids should have access to their own computer is preposterous and obnoxious and needs to end. We knew we were on to something when Girls at Methodist Ladies College in Melbourne, Australia in 1989-1990 began decorating their laptops with glitter pen and stickers. That's when they had ownership of it. Not only of the machine, but of the ideas they construct within it. And you can't work on anything sophisticated unless you have time and access. And there's no greater impediment to girls being interested in computing than fighting over computer time. And there's been books that have been written on the subject. I'll end with this last ex example. I was working at the American School of Bombay and we, we introduced all kinds of maker technology to the kids. And then we said, play, pick your groups, work with your friends, you have three hours, we had Makey Makeys and Arduinos and Hummingbirds and wearable technology. And this one little girl sat at her computer, she had just seen turtle art for the first time, and she began programming, and she programmed and programmed and programmed for so long that it almost took on an air of defiance. And when she was done after a few hours, we asked if she'd share with us what she had created. And hopefully the animation's gonna go. I'll try one more time. Is it working? 
When you clicked on the super procedure, the turtle draws I love you. And it's, you know, quite poignant and worth remembering that maybe when you're 15 years old, there's stuff that matters more to you than the Pythagorean theorem. Except you're using the Pythagorean theorem in its expression of love. So, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a lot of reasons to justify teaching kids to, to, to learn to program. Um, hopefully we're moving past an era where we've spent 30 years arguing about why kids shouldn't learn to program, whether it's the corporate folks or the White House who are at least mouthing the words to computer science for all. I think this is important and we have to have a sense of, a, of urgency because it's fun, because it's empowering, because it has economic implications, um, but most of all because it helps kids feel smart and have agency over an increasingly complex and technologically sophisticated world. Thanks a lot, folks. Thanks for the work you do. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. And no giraffe. Oh, there is a band playing behind it somewhere. I always say that speaking of Maker Fair is like fear factor. We, we, have, we want to take a question or two? Or we're done? Yeah, I think we have a minute for questions. It's not raining. There's no drone. But it's, so it's pretty good so far. But Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. My computer's doing something bad here, so that's why I couldn't see what was going on. Thanks. Anyone have a harder question? Yes. <laughs> How do I get computer science required in my school? Um, well, you can either embed it in everything you teach across the curriculum, um, but you know, the one, the art. I'd like to do that. Yeah. Well, well, the a, there's this new AP course, so schools that have that take things like AP seriously might want to take that seriously. But you should look at those courses because they're, they're the AP has learned the lesson of history, and they're not forcing everyone to learn one language or use one curriculum. So there's a lot of choices, and not all of them are good ones. Um, the beauty and joy of computing is not bad. Um, so the fact that there's going to be this computer science for non-computer science majors course called computer science principles and because the white house is saying every kid should learn computer science i think that's gonna gonna help you with the argument not not that any of them know what that means in the slightest anybody else i'll be i'll stick around and be happy to take some questions thanks folks thanks make <laughs>